Welcome back to the COAST 217 lecture. In this lecture, we're covering three distinct topics, structures, command line arguments, and dynamic memory. In a recent lecture, we saw arrays as a data type that could hold multiple distinct pieces of data, but they all had to be in the same type. C structures are closer to Java classes, though without the instance methods. They can hold multiple distinct pieces of data of differing types, just like an object's instance variables. So this would have been useful for assignment one's challenge to return both the new state and the updated line number. Now we actually know how to do this with pointers or an array of two items, but this would be another reasonable approach. So how do we do this in C? Structure types are declared with the name of a new structure. Similar to enums, we have the keyword and then the identifier and then its contents, a list of fields. One syntactic thing that I always forget is that you have to end it with a semicolon. This makes sense, this is just like any other declaration, but the curly braces sort of speak to me as though they were functions or something like it, and I always forget the semicolon. Luckily, um, most code auto-indenters will um, indent the next line, and so you'll look at it and say, that looks weird, and you'll go back up and, and find the error. All right, so we can initialize a structure variable with an initializer list, just like we did with arrays. We can declare a pointer to a struct, just like we can have pointers to anything else that we've seen. And we access the fields in a struct quite like how we access the instance variables in Java, using the dot field selection operator. If we have a pointer handle, we would dereference the pointer first, and then use the dot operator. So the dereference, recall, says follow the arrow to get to what I'm pointing at. What, is, what am I pointing at in this case is a struct, and so now I can do a dot. But this is super common, so much so that there's actually a more idiomatic way built into the language. It's the arrow operator, which is absolutely identical to the dereference and dot pair. So the arrow says dereference this pointer and access this particular field. The arrow operator is going to be perhaps your most used operator outside of assignment and loop control. So get familiar with it, um, make it your friend. You might have noticed that the structure boxes in the previous slide seem to be bigger than the components. Is that true? Let's write a program. All right, so over here I already have a, a demo set up. Um, let's see just what size these structs are. We're going to want to print them out. I'll recreate the structure that we saw in the slides. I will not forget the semicolon. And what do I want to do here? I'll start off with just struct. S, S1 is um, a double and an int. Let's see what its size is. Recall that with the size of operator, you can, in fact, give a variable or a type. So let's use the type for now. That should work for now. I haven't used S1, but that's OK. And it tells me that it's 16 bytes. So my graphic was right that there's more than just the size of a, dub of a double and just the size of an int. Let's investigate a little bit closer. Let's take each of the components and see what their sizes are. So 
So as expected, the double is 8 bytes and the int is 4 bytes. So it's not breaking any of the rules we know about the sizes of the, um, the components on ArmLab. So what's going on here? Again, let's investigate just a little bit further still. Let's go ahead and print out where in memory these are. So the stack location in memory will change every time you run the program, but the relative offset should be the same. So let's take a look. All right, so now we have all three of these to print out the addresses in memory of this. Let's take a look. I get some warnings here because uh, technically the percent %p requires a void star, and these are not void stars. Um, this is a, a struct star, a, a double star, and an int star. But for our purposes right now, we're going to ignore the warnings and take a look. So here we have the addresses. The structure is at this big address uh, with um, the last two digits in hex being 70. The double is at the same location. So the double begins right at the very beginning of the struct. And then the integer is eight bytes later. So that's exactly what it should be. That to me says that there's something after the integer. And I don't know what exactly is there. So let's just confirm, see if that's true. We can't guarantee exactly how the compiler is going to put local variables on the stack, but in this case on ArmLab, we will see that it actually does put them in order. So let's try this. Let's put a double before and after it. Again, not guaranteed to work in every case, but for this program it will. And let's see what the addresses are of those two variables on the stack. So we're going to get the address of J and the address of I. Again, we compile. Again, we get even more warnings this time. And now we see that J is 8 bytes before the beginning of the struct. That makes sense. J is a double. It's 8 bytes long. And I is 8 bytes after the beginning of the i component in the struct. But i should the i component should be only 4 bytes. So there is padding after the i component, after the i field in the struct. And this is actually not unusual. So the compiler knows what the architecture likes. And the architecture likes for for performance reasons to have different members of uh, different variables or different data um, at addresses that are divisible typically by nice numbers, like the natural word size, in this case, 8 bytes. So here we, we will see that instead of putting the int 4 bytes and then starting the next variable immediately thereafter, it says, nope, I'm going to go ahead and put 4 bytes in between. I'm going to waste those bytes because it aligns things well. And we'll come back to this later in the course about um, what the compiler does and what the uh, architecture preferences are for alignment and why. But for now, you just have to know that in a structure, the size of the structure is at least as big as the sum of the fields, but it could be bigger because of padding. So let's come back to the PowerPoint. All right. Um, so depending on the compiler's choices about padding, um, we might have this extra space. In this program on ArmLab, we do. You might have noticed that the structure um, is uh, the double and then the int. And I didn't think to ask, does ordering matter? So let's go back to the program and swap some variables. So what happens now if we have the int and then the double as the components of the structure? At this
this point now we have the int has the same address as the struct. Um, and then the double has an address that is 8 bytes later than that. I know it looks like 2, but remember that these are hex, so 2 higher than 8 is not 0, it's A. Um, so we go all the way 8 bytes uh, greater than that. And so, again, we have this padding in inside the structure, even though it's actually in between fields, not at the end. So this is what it looks like in the updated case with um, the int and then the double. And this is something that the compiler can't control. We said that it could choose how to align data, but the C standard says that it may not reorder the fields within a struct. And that means that, yes, we can have internal padding. All right, so that was our um, live coding, and hopefully it worked. Um, so now the next thing I want to talk about is arrays of structs. And so arrays of structs are legal, and they're actually part of the reason why that padding happens. Because the architecture is particularly concerned about alignment when there are many structures that may be accessed in rapid succession. And it knows that arrays are typically something that gets iterated over, more so than one-off variables. So um, note here the sort of neat nested initializer list. The outer one is for the array, and the inner one is for the uh, struct at the zeroth element of the array. And here we can also see something that's different from arrays. Unlike in arrays, we can do assignment of structs with equal. It does a deep copy. All of the fields are copied over. And we see this in the memory where the exact copy gets made in uh, with each field getting copied rather than some sort of reference or not being allowed at all in the syntax as it was for arrays. So as with arrays, we can pass structures to a function. Unlike with arrays, we can return structures from a function. Also, unlike with arrays, when we pass a structure into a function, they're passed by value, not with a pointer. Check out this example where we try three different approaches to swap. The first changes the parameter within the function, but that's a local copy. It's, it's copied over um, uh, just like an int would be on the function call. And so changing the value of the parameter, the, the copy that's in the function, has no impact whatsoever on the struct in main. So this doesn't actually work as swap. The second swap looks to do exactly the same, but then the local copy is returned. And then we use the return value to overwrite main's copy with the return value. And so in this case, the swap succeeds. And then in swap three, we can see that we can also do it using pointers, the same as we would with um, individual variables in you know, swapping two ints or something like that. All right, so that was sort of a big info dump. Um, what better way to have just a little bit more info dump than to ask a question that you can't possibly know the answer to? But that's what I'm going to do here. So in this program, we have the opposite. Rather than an array of structures, we have a structure with a field that is an array. And here we have, um, in main, we have uh, the declaration and, and in initialization of s, and then we go and um, initialize s2 to be a copy of s. And then we call print on s2. So how many arrays exist in memory at any point? Perhaps, say, during print s, which would potentially be the most. So pause the video, think about it, see if you can come, come up with a convincing explanation for how many arrays are in memory. So the answer here is d. There are three. S has an array inside of it. When we do a copy, when we do an assignment of uh, S into S2, we make a copy. We do um, a full field-wise copy of everything, including the array. So even though we can't actually make that copy with just an, uh, an assignment equals um, with arrays ourselves, underneath the hood, when assigning structures, we can't. Furthermore, then, when we pass the structure to the function, again, we said that they're passed by value, and that's a field-wise copy again. The parameter will have all of the fields just copied over. They'll have their own copy. 
So there are three of this array that exist in memory. One inside the struct s, one inside the struct s2, and one inside the parameter s in the prints uh, stack frame. All right. So thus far, we haven't really been given much input into our programs. Uh, we've seen scanf, but we haven't really used it much, and we um, haven't seen command line arguments at all. So the next thing we're going to cover now that we've seen structs is command line arguments. And that's actually one of the first things that you learned in 126 before you ever saw standard in was how to work with command line. Um, in fact, the mystic incantation public static void main string bracket args didn't actually stay very mystic for very long. You started knocking them out pretty quickly with what was main, oh, it's the place where it starts, and what was args, it's the command line arguments. What was string bracket? Well, we haven't talked about arrays yet, but we'll get there soon. And what was string? It's just a type. It's almost like an object, but it is an object, but it's almost like a primitive. All of this stuff you covered in a remarkably quick uptake in 126, especially considering that now we're a third of the way into 217 and we haven't seen it yet. Let's fix that. How does a program get command line arguments, including the program's own name? As I said, in Java, it was an array of strings, and indeed, it's the same in C. So now that we've seen arrays, and we've seen strings as special cases of arrays, the, not, the logical next step is to combine them, an array of strings. This also makes it your first example of a multidimensional structure, um, an array of pointers to characters, we saw the meta example of the, the um, double pointer in the pointers lecture, but now we're going to get to actually flex it a little bit. So an array of pointers to characters. That is an array, each of whose elements is a character pointer. Note here that um, you'll see two different types given for argv, depending on what program you're uh, looking at, and that's simply because the same idea you're working on in assignment two. As function parameters, pointers and arrays are equivalent, so the next level more pointery, that's still the case. char star star argv is the same as char star argv brackets. All right, so let's see this program in action. I didn't mention it on the previous slide, but along with argv is also argc, the count of arguments. This comes back to the idea that, unlike in Java, where we could just do args.length, in C, we don't know how long the array passed in is unless we provide a count. However, here we have a couple of potential off-by-one quirks that you'll continually have to either look up or, or memorize by rote to keep straight. So argv0 is the program name, and that counts as an argument in terms of the count of argc. Also, we have, along with all of the actual arguments given on the command line, so argv1 and argv2 and argv3. And argc, then, is the count of the arguments, not the array elements. And so it's always one more than the number of arguments. Um, uh, the, the number of array elements is always one more than the number of arguments because the array is also guaranteed to end in null. So the last array element is always null. So this uh, example, we have five elements in the array, four arguments, and the, the obligatory null final element. But the argc is counting arguments, not array indexes. Um, and so it's four. Looking at this with the, the smaller example here, we have um, a print argv that's given no arguments whatsoever. Well, it actually has one argument, because argv0, the program name, counts as an argument. So argc, of, uh, argc is 1, and argv of 0 is a string, and then we reach the null pointer, uh, sorry, the, the, the null pointer at the end of argv, and we exhaust our arguments in argc. All right, so having seen that, what's argc for this invocation? Here the answer is b. And the reason here is that we have four arguments. The quotation marks in bash indicate that this is all one single string. It's just a string that happens to have, quota uh, have spaces in it. So the quotation marks allow us to say spaces aren't special. They don't 
uh, demarcate the or delineate the the uh, spaces between arguments. They're just other characters that are within one given argument. So we have uh, argc is four. Zero is the name. One is one. Uh, two is the string two space space three, and four is, and uh, argv four is um, four. All right. So I mentioned I mentioned that the last element in argv is always null. So that actually means that argc is superfluous. We could just traverse argv until we hit that null element. So here's an equivalent of program expressed as a pointer algorithm. Um, using the traveling pointer instead of the index, like you're going to be doing in assignment two. And if you're um, weirded out at the end here by the um, subtraction of pointers, the subtraction of pointers, uh, you might recall from precept, is just the span. It says how many elements um, d does, this, uh, does this combination of pointers encompass? And then the even more cryptic thing is the last argument of this printf, which is a combined uh, dereference and increment, and I totally agree it's cryptic. But it is a common idiom. Um, I'd still prefer to parenthesize, and even then, um, in many cases, uh, GCC will throw a warning saying, basically, are you sure you know what you're doing? Because I'm not entirely sure that you're doing this right or that it's well-defined by the standard of the language. However, this program does, in fact, work on ArmLab, at the very least, um, and it does the exact same thing. So um, we, we walk through, and instead of uh, walking through by index, we're walking through checking, does star PPC equal null? So star PPC, we're saying that's a pointer to a, uh, a, pointer to a character is, is a PPC. So star PC sorry, PPC, sorry, is a pointer to a character. Well, that's a pointer. That means we can check if it's null. And indeed, in argv, the last pointer to a character is going to be null. So here we can walk through one at a time, each time checking, is a PPC pointing at something that is null? If so, we're done. If not, we can print out the thing that PPC points to as a string and then increment it, bump it up to the next thing. And eventually we do hit null and we're done. In our second example here, um, we hit null a lot quicker. All right, so here's a slightly modified version of the previous code. Um, I've added an explicit index uh, for, the, uh, in for the index instead of pointer subtraction, but Still, when I look at this code, I see pointers to pointers, and it would be natural to wonder if that's silly and we could just have one level of indirection. So think about it for a minute. See if you can trace something out. See if it works. As it ends up, we can't. What the code on the right does is it steps through the um, argv0 one character at a time which is certainly not what we were trying to do. Worse, because PC will never be equal to null, at least not until it overflows the uh, address of um, 16 Fs and all the way back to 16 zeros in hex, um, it'll keep going on and on and on and on and never break the loop. And so eventually getting itself uh, into memory that it doesn't have access to, and that's a seg fault, which you'll become intimately familiar with and I will um, soon attempt to convince you that it is your friend, even though it is the, the canonical bane of C programmers. All right, but yes, this program, if we try and take away you know, one, one fewer pointer, um, sadly enough, it doesn't actually work. All right, so this is the last bit on arguments. Take a look at this legal, though admittedly completely contrived, a program that does the unthinkable. It recurs on main. So what does it do? Again, pause the video, trace it out, see what you can come up with. So in the first iteration of this program, um, argc is 4, and so we're going to recur on the value 3 for argc, and ABC. We 
we bump forward our pointer, uh, argv, by 1. We don't actually change argv, we just pass in the argument to this new call to main to be argv plus 1. And so that's going to give it the array uh, abc, as opposed to program name abc. So now our, in, in our next uh, call to main, argc is 3, so we recur on 2bc. When we recur, argc is 2, so we recur on 1c. Um, when we recur, argc is 1, we recur on 0, null. Recall that argv ends in a null. At that point, though, we hit our base case. Um, argc is 0. So we backtrack from the base case, and we print out 0c. That was the case where argc was 1 and um, argv was, was just uh, pointing at c, and then the null. Um, but in this case, when we actually print it, we print argc minus 1 to get sort of the right indices. Um, so we print out 0c, we return the value uh, back. That's actually just the value we got back from the base case, which was hard-coded at 0. So this program can't help but succeed. Um, so then we uh, print 1b, return that same 0, print 2a, return that same 0, and then 3 and the program name. A couple of things to note here. Um, D would actually be right if instead of returning from the base case, we did exit 0. So return, just like in Java, just like in any other function, main isn't special in this case, return says return to where I was called from. Exit, on the other hand, says terminate the program right here and now with this status. So if um, instead of returning, we did an exit 0, we would in fact only print the um, very last argument because we'd print only the first printf, um, but doing it backwards. Okay, now for the main event, dynamic memory. Thus far, we've been really limited to only being able to write static um, programs. Sure, we can take input from the user, but only if it's changing a value that we already knew about and allocated at compile time. Surely we'll have to do better than that. Consider the common case of taking an arbitrary number of inputs. If we have to store each of them, and we don't know how many there will be until runtime, we're out of luck. So enter dynamic memory. That is, memory that's allocated during runtime based on the state of the program at that point. For this, we'll use an entirely different section of memory than we've seen thus far, the heap. Just as a quick reminder, we've seen the stack, that's where our uh, function parameters and local variables go. We've seen the text section, at least sort of. We, we've mentioned the text section is where the program code actually lives, the machine code. Um, and then the RO data section we've seen as the place where string literals go. So the heap is a new section for us, and it's where we're going to put our dynamically allocated data. And we'll access the heap based on pointers into the heap, into that data, from the stack or from other sections we haven't seen yet. So let's dive into some code. The basic function for dynamic allocation is malloc. It takes as an argument the number of bytes of memory to allocate. This immediately presents a problem for portability, because if we're trying to allocate in terms of bytes, and in C so many of the types aren't well specified uh, by the standard, instead they're, they're system specific in terms of their size, we could be in trouble. But it's okay, because we've seen uh, in a previous lecture the size of operator which allows us to tell on a particular machine how big any uh, size, any uh, type, or any variable is. So we can make use of this. The program here is what, we've, what I just described on the last slide. We have a pointer to the stack that points at memory dynamically allocated to the heap. And that dynamically allocated memory we get, at, we get with the malloc call. So notice that um, malloc allocates the memory. If we look at the, the little drawing, drawing there, we get these three boxes, these three integers in the heap, but it doesn't touch the contents. They'll be whatever garbage happened to be in memory at that location, and it's completely unreliable what that will be. So this is the, the core um, use of malloc, where we're going to say, go get me some memory. I'm going to have a handle to it um, as a pointer, uh, in uh, on my stack or as a parameter or what have you in some sort of local variable and um, then I can use it by using the 
arrow operator, just like we saw before, or by dereferencing and then using um, uh, the dot operator if these are structs. If it's just an int in this case, well, in that case, I can just say dereference and I get the int itself. So if that garbage data freaked you out a little bit, or if you dislike the very explicit allocation of a big chunk of bytes um, to do with as you please, there's another basic function for uh, allocation. It's calloc. And the difference uh, between calloc and malloc is, is twofold. Number one, it zeroes out memory when it allocates. So it just puts a, a zeros in every single bit of, um, of the data that gets allocated. This means that for these ints, they will in fact have the value zero, if you recall from our, uh, our representation lecture where all zeros was um, a non-negative number because it didn't have a leftmost bit of one, and then we just interpret the rest of it as binary, and so it is in fact zero. Um, number two, it at least in my view, more clearly, um, uh, Calic more clearly has an array semantic because we see that it asks for the number of items and the size of each item. Frankly, I have to go and look it up a whole lot of times uh, when I start to use Calic um, in terms of which one's which, but that's silly because number one, um, it's the same order. I would naturally do the, the multiplication in malloc, k times the size of an int, well, k comma the size of an int, and b, multiplication is commutative anyway, so who cares? But um, this is, in fact, the correct ordering for Kellogg. It says how many items are you taking and how, um, uh, how many items are you requesting, are you uh, trying to allocate, and how many uh, bytes for each of them is, uh, is required. So our memory schematic is just slightly different, whereas before we had, um, after the allocation, we had three garbage values. Using Kellogg, we have three values that are all zero. So the third of your new friends here is free. In Java, you never had to clean up after yourself because um, Java has automatic garbage collection. The, the um, garbage collector can go through and say, I know that you will never use this variable again, so I will clean it up. This could be if you cease to reference it anymore, if you uh, point a reference uh, at some other value, or just at the point in the program where you uh, deterministically will never access that variable again. In C, that's not the case. You have to pick up your own messes, which is to say you have to give back the memory that's dynamically allocated to you when you're done using it. And the way to do this is with the free function, which takes a pointer previously returned by one of the allocation functions. It's important to note that calling free on a pointer that didn't come back from one of the allocation functions is likely a very bad thing. It will likely corrupt your heap and um, eventually kill your program. Additionally, it's uh, another uh, thing to note is that calling free on a pointer doesn't change the value of the pointer. It can't, in fact, since the pointers are passed by value to functions. You know, the, the address is passed as a value. And so we can't go back and change it unless there's that extra level of indirection like we saw with meta. But that means that after freeing, you still have a pointer referencing the now freed memory. This is called a dangling pointer. And by itself, it's not an error. If we look at the slide here, we can happily have that pointer of some ints pointing into the heap. That's not a problem. But if we try to access what that pointer points to, if we try to dereference it or use it in some way, there, there will be problems. So stay tuned in a few more slides for that. The last of your new friends is realloc. Realloc says, I was given a pointer um, that was previously returned from malloc or calloc, and it's not enough space, so I want to get um, to change this uh, allocation to um, change this, uh, this allocation to make it bigger or potentially make it smaller. So here's an example of making it smaller. Um, we call realloc on the pointer we were given and a new size. I'm sorry for all of you budding Kellogg fa uh, fans, it's the malloc syntax of, um, it's just the number of bytes. So uh, also if we reallocate things, we have no guarantees about their, their value of the new memory. Um, 
beyond the, the point at which the old memory had already been allocated. So, a little tricky if you kind of already have fallen in love with Kellogg. You have to know at least a little bit about how, um, what we can and can't do or can and can't assume with malloc because realloc does the same. So in this uh, version we have uh, k minus 1, so we're decreasing the number of ints. And this is um, what most typically will happen after that. But it's not guaranteed by the C standard. On, on ArmLab, I believe the implementation does in fact do exactly this. It will not move the allocation when it makes it smaller. It will just say, okay, this allocation used to be 3 ints big, it's now only 2 ints big, but it leaves it in place. But that's not guaranteed by the standard, so you shouldn't typically assume that. Here's um, perhaps the more common or useful um, use of realloc, which is, hey, I don't have enough memory. I, I thought they were only going to give me three, but in fact they want four. So in this case, we can call realloc and ask for more, um, k plus one times size of int. And in this case, uh, again, typically, but not guaranteed, um, realloc is going to try to expand the memory in place. This makes sense from an efficiency standpoint. We won't have to copy over all of the memory uh, values that are in our current allocation to a new location if we just keep it the same. But clearly we can't always do this. Maybe there's something already in memory immediately after our array. So we can't always do it. Sometimes it will look like this. Especially if the expansion is large and you're asking for a lot of memory, well, the larger the memory, the more likely that you are to run into something that prevents you from just saying, yeah, I'll just expand it and, and uh, make it longer. So in this case, uh, when realloc has to move the allocation, it will return the, the pointer to the new location of this memory. It will copy all of the values over. Note that, as I mentioned, it won't make any guarantees about what's in the new memory that it's, that it's added. Um, so just like malloc, it's not going to initialize it. And it's going to free the old allocation. This makes sense because, you know, if you're saying, hey, I want you to make this thing bigger, well, okay, I made it bigger. I had to move it, so I'll clean up after um, myself uh, as realloc. I'm not going to make the user do that. This means that the user, for every single uh, uh, malloc or calloc they do, needs to do exactly one free. They don't have to sort of count the number of times they've called realloc, which would get pretty tricky uh, pretty quickly. So um, this is what uh, the memory looks like. But here, again, we have this dangling pointer. Some ints points at the location that it used to point to, which, is now been, which has now been freed, and more ints points at the new, um, the, the new allocation. So if we were using this program uh, for real, likely some ints is the, the array that we are thinking of using throughout, we would want to check and say, okay, now that I, I have more ints, now I can set that back to be some ints. And we'll see why we use this, uh, this two-variable version in just a moment. Before we do that, though, let's talk about what can go wrong with malloc and calloc. The key thing that can go wrong with, with uh, either of these is that there could be no memory available. The system could say, nope, I can't give you that much memory. In that case, um, malloc and calloc return null. They, instead of returning, returning a pointer to the new allocation, they return a pointer to nothing. It says, yeah, I couldn't give you that, so I, I'm not pointing you at anything. Um, this is fine. I mean, it's bad that you couldn't get your memory, but potentially life could go on. Um, typically in this course, we're going to say if you can't get the memory, there's not a whole lot you can do, so terminate the program nicely. But in general, it's not automatically an error. Certainly there are programs where if they fail to allocate memory, the correct answer is, okay, wait a little bit, see if some memory frees up. The problem here is that you have to check for that. You have to check to say, did malloc or calloc return null? Because otherwise, the very next thing you're going to do here is you're going to say, oh, I want to use that memory. And so some ints of zero, for example, here, well, recall that, um, that the brackets for an array is the equivalent of dereferencing a pointer. But if some ints is null and we dereference a null pointer, that is a sig fault. 
dereference a pointer says go to the memory and access it, and we are guaranteed that you cannot access address zero. So that's a seg fault. That will kill your program. How do we avoid that? Check. We should say if some ints is null, we need to do something, whether that's wait around and see if it gets better, or whether it's uh, terminate the program in some nice way that says, I'm sorry, user, I could not allocate the memory, have a good day, as opposed to sig seg v program aborted crash. You know, the former is probably a little bit nicer. So that was malloc and calloc. Free has some more things going on in terms of uh, what can go wrong. I mentioned dangling pointers that they aren't inherently dangerous until you access them, until you uh, dereference them. And for whatever reason it is, dangling pointers are inexplicably um, tempting to, to access. So um, if we use a pointer after free, something like this, um, we go and we say, yeah, set some ints of zero to be x. That's a problem because we don't actually own that memory anymore. In the best case, we're just overwriting some memory that's no longer in use, and we will hopefully cannot continue to use it, and so we'll probably never read that value. In the worst case, sometime in between the free and that sum ints of zero gets x, there's been another malloc or another calloc somewhere, and that memory has now been allocated to some other data structure. And now when we put x in that memory, we are corrupting that data structure. We're overwriting that data structure. That seems bad. The other problem here is that um, we go and we free this pointer again. A double free, depending on the implementation of malloc, could be harmless or could be catastrophic. On ArmLab, it's the latter. On ArmLab, it corrupts the heap, and the reason why is that free adds the um, adds a pointer to um, adds the pointer that, that it's passed to a data structure that basically tracks what memory is free. When we call free again, free adds it again to the data structure. So now it exists twice in the data structure. So if that memory later gets malloced, it's in this weird state of being both free and malloced. Also, if um, we do some other fancier things that we, we coalesce or split up uh, our, our memory locations so that we can you know, basically allow for, for larger allocations, well now we'll, we're going to go through and find one of them and the other existing block is still going to be sitting there in that data structure. So now the middle of some larger block of data is itself an alias. It's bad um, because now we can, you know, again, return that from malloc and without doing anything further wrong in dynamic memory management, corrupt the heap. So bad things all around, if you, at least on ArmLab, if you do a double free. My personal advice here, um, cut off dangling pointers by setting freed pointers to null as a matter of habit. As soon as you call free, immediately turn around and set that pointer to point at null. This isn't a panacea. If you do these things um, of uh, access after free, it's still a bug. But it's a bug that you'll be able to find because when you access that pointer and after the free and you, you do some ints of zero, when it's null, oh, that's a crash. It's a seg fault. Yes, that's bad. We just said that you know it terminates your program. But when your program gets terminated, you can use GDB to go and find exactly where it happened. And it's relatively quick to, to figure out least usually. On the other hand, when you're just randomly writing to data that isn't part of your uh, active, uh, of your active uh, structure that you've already freed, you're corrupting something else. Now you start to get weird logic errors where you're like, how did that value change? I have no idea. So I think that uh, this is um, typically a better solution is to immediately set it to null uh, as soon as you're done using it, you do the free, you set it to null, and now you don't have this, this temptation to use dangling pointer. Or rather, if you do have this temptation, you get shut down pretty quickly. Um, also, uh, the double free problem goes away because free doesn't actually do anything if the argument is null. If you pass null to free, it's a no-op. And so we don't have this heap corruption with, uh, with the double free either. All right, so now let's come back to realloc. 
programmer mistakes using realloc, using the same pointer. So looking here, everything looks fine. If realloc, uh, so calloc uh, points up there, and now if, um, if realloc moves, that, you know, could be fine because we, we track it. If realloc doesn't move, we reassign it and fine, it, you know, we, we overwrite the same value. The singular case here that is a problem is when realloc fails. When realloc returns null, we now have overwritten our pointer. We have some ints points at null, but some ints was the only thing we knew of how to get to this memory in the heap. So now we have no way to get to the memory that was allocated. When realloc returns null, it doesn't move it. It just leaves everything the same. It doesn't move it. It doesn't free it. It says, I couldn't give you a new allocation, but here's your old one that still exists, and I'm telling you this via null. And so if we then overwrite the pointer here, we no longer have access to the old one, and that's bad. It gets worse, though. We could do even worse. Rather than um, uh, overwriting the same pointer, we could forget to save the value of realloc at all. It might be fine. If it was expanded or contracted in place, everything's great. The, the existing sum ints pointer points at the right location. But if not, but if not, we will have a memory leak because our new data has nothing pointing to it. We still have a dangling pointer that's there pointing at the freed data, which again would be fine except we're good programmers, we're totally going to do the right thing later on, and we're going to free it. But now it's already been freed by realloc, so now it's a double free. So we get a memory leak, an access dangling pointer, and a double free, all from one bug of forgetting to, uh, to save the value returned from realloc. Again, the correct way to do this is with two pointers, that way you can um, save the value returned from realloc, you can then check and see whether it was null, in which case the first pointer is still valid. Otherwise, you can um, overwrite or, or reset the old pointer with the new pointer. So that's the, the troubles with realloc. All right, so finishing up this lecture, let's take a look at two quick concept questions for dynamic memory. Here's the first one. Take a look. Uh, we have new copy is uh, the result or is pointed at the result of calling malloc on stir len of old copy. And then we uh, stir copy, old copy into new copy. So we're allocating space and then doing a copy of the string. Does it work? Well, it says catch the most common bugs. So the answer here is clearly no. Um, and the bug here is that you forgot the space for the null byte. Recall that stir len returns the number of characters in a string not including the null byte. But when we make a copy of the string, we need to have enough space for the null byte. So the correct answer here would be to do a malloc of sterlin of old copy plus one. And finally, here's a sort of tricky thing. This looks like it would save a line of uh, code, admittedly at the cost of some clarity, by using a call to malloc as the first argument to stir copy, rather than doing a malloc, saving the pointer, and then using that pointer as the first argument to stir copy. Does it work? Take a moment to think about it. The answer is yes, it works the vast majority of the time. However, if malloc fails, that means it returns null, and now we are passing null as one of the parameters to stir copy, which violates its preconditions. In uh, your version of um, uh, from assignment two, you would have a failed assertion. Um, depending on exactly which implementation of the stir copy library, you will either have a failed assertion or you'll have a really mysterious crash when it attempts to write to a null pointer. So that's all I have for dynamic memory and for this lecture. Good luck working on assignment two due next week. I'll look forward to seeing everyone in office hours.